I'm Prerit Garg. I'm the general manager for identity and directory services at AWS. Um, it's a job that I took on about six months ago. Um, uh, I joined AWS about a year ago. Uh, but in interestingly enough, uh, I have a long history in this space. Um, uh, it's sort of a like full 360 for me coming back. I was part of the original team that built Active Directory at Microsoft. Um, and I, I was like looking around saying, okay, well, can I find something that goes back in time? Uh, and so I found this thing from InfoWorld July 2002. I actually went to Burton Group uh, uh, Catalyst Conference, and I, this is sort of the inception of the Federation Services work uh, that started at Microsoft with Active Directory Federation Services. So that was sort of the code I found. Um, kind of reminds me how far the industry has come uh, for all of us. So um, it's kind of interesting. The, the other sort of thing about me is that I actually left the space. Uh, I left uh, the directory and identity space in 2003, uh, and I went to systems management. I helped Microsoft um, in sort of the systems management business um, for a few years. And I said, well, it's time to me for me to go off and do something totally different. Uh, I just started a company um, in the worst economic time in 2008, 2009. Um, lucky for us, we actually got it funded. Uh, we actually exited uh, that company. We sold it to Quantum uh, about a year and a half ago. And then I was uh, looking at doing what, my, what I wanted to do next, and uh, lo and behold, AWS calls upon me and says, hey, we want you to come over and help us uh, in the space. So, so it's kind of a full 360 for me, coming back to the identity space. I'll be honest with you, unlike uh, what Andre and, uh, said, I don't think of myself as an identitarian. <laughs> Um, I think of building applications, and I think of uh, myself as a builder. Uh, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is in that context, to make talking about what does it take to build applications with identity? Because identity and authentication tends to be sort of a key piece you need for any application to be turned on. Um, so with that context, right? So coming back into the space, of course, the first thing I did, I was like, let me look what's going on in the identity space. I've been out of the space for 10 plus years. And uh, so I started looking for, so here are some of the things that Google search found for me, right? 97% um, of SaaS um, vendors are using SAML-based single sign-on. For some, something that, you know, about 12, uh, 13 years ago that we've, we had started to lay some foundation for, to actually see that it's pervasive um, was actually uh, great to see. Now, I didn't make that happen. You guys did. So, um, but it was great to sort of see it actually coming to fusion. Um, the industry has come a long way. With Now you see consumer identities and OAuth 2.0 and a lot of work that's gone in that space as well. Um, there's sort of a bridging of standards going on with uh, SAML assertions as part of OAuth 2. Uh, that work is happening as well. So you're sort of seeing some, uh, some of that. And then I love my favorite quote from Craig Burton about SAML being dead and the controversy that created. I think what he meant by, it's like we're done with SAML. I think we've kind of, it's pretty broadly adopted. We've got to look beyond that. So that's sort of the theme uh, that I'm going to focus on today. I think, I think uh, you guys have done a great job. Uh, a lot of you folks have moved this industry over the last 15 years. Uh, Identity Federations um, is by far one of the things that's driving um, the cloud economy today, right? Customers do want to use their existing identities and the infrastructure they have. I think Alex talked about 90% of customers having uh, Active Directory in their environment. Uh, they want to use identities and investments they've made in those identities and to bridge to the cloud world, to the federated world. Um, so congratulations and thank you. Um, but I, I do want to sort of set the stage and talk about um, um, Sorry. Somehow this joke didn't come out right. It's supposed to say uh, there's a line missing in this. I heard. I think it's the Mac doing it to me because <laughs> I built it on Windows, right? So I heard you. I uh, I heard you like ASN1. So I put an octet string in your octet string so you can parse while you parse. Uh, um, and I say this because you know. Uh, again, I'm an old head now. I'm um, I passed 40, and you know. Uh, if, you, if you were as old as I am, you remember having to debug ASN1 encodings and having to see wire protocols and deal with some of that stuff. So I, there is a certain amount of skepticism to the work we have done around SAML or 
a lot of these things and ask the question, have we actually simply adapted Kerberos-based protocols to the web? Uh, have we replaced the SN1 encodings now with XML and JSON? Now, this is not to undermine the work. Um, there's a lot of value to the work done. Building a, a cryptographically sound protocol is non-trivial. Uh, it's better that we do it once than have app developers do it every time. So, so don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, similarly, I think there is a lot of having somebody who debugged ASN1, uh, there's a lot of value to making programmability easy with XML or now with JSON. So this is not to undermine. But the point is that I think, unfortunately, wire protocols are not sufficient. Um, what applications at the end of the day need assertions and claims about these identities. They, that's the meaningful stuff. After the, the protocol dance is over, they need to be able to make decisions with these assertions to say whether access should be allowed or not allowed. And so there's a lot of semantics that are associated with these assertions and claims. And unfortunately, we, I haven't seen a lot of work done in this area. Um, uh, at least when I looked around in the past 10 years, we haven't sort of moved the needle around how to make that some of those stuff easy for applications. Let me kind of give you an example. Um, as I hope all of you know, uh, at AWS, we do support um, uh, SAML-based federation for our enterprise customers. We've added OpenID uh, Open Connect support as well later uh, last year. But I'll tell you, it's really hard to set some of this stuff up. Uh, so if you're not living and breathing some of these things, it's very hard. You have to set up the, the identity provider, then you have to, that identity provider and the SAML metadata that you get really doesn't tell you how much you are willing to trust this. So now you have to encode trust mechanisms as part of setting up this trust relationship uh, with an external IDP. And by the way, that's not enough because you start trusting it, well, you also have to set up permissions of what the identities that are gonna come across and what they can do in your environment. So you have to go set up policies around all these access control uh, policies that you have to set up. And you know, if you're a typical IT administrator, you really don't want to deal with a lot of that stuff. You want to be able to point and click uh, many of these things and set them up. So we have a you know, lot of customers actually dealing with this level of complexity, and they are setting this up. You know, as part of the standards, some, some of these attributes were defined, but I haven't seen pervasive use of them and I'll talk about some of the things that we haven't done with respect to making a lot of these assertions easy to use. Um, so, you know, we did this work, and we, we do have customers using it for where they have significant investments in SAML-based federation mechanisms, and they, they've dug in deep enough so they understand all the gobbledygook that exists. But we had a lot of customers telling us that this is way too hard. I don't want to set up on my own federa federation server. I, don't want, I have existing identities and infrastructure, just make it easy so that I can use my identities so, uh, in my AWS environment. So we ended up actually launching a federation capability that doesn't depend on uh, federation standards that exist. So we implemented something called AD Connector that's actually a proxy back to the customer's directory. And I'll tell you why we had to go do that work, because it was just too hard to set up access. Um, so with this, you could actually, in three steps, get a f federation up and running. And then now you can very granularly control access to who is granted access. So you can use roles within AWS, and then you can map them to specific users in your directory. You can look them up. Uh, you can look up groups. Uh, and it's all literally click-through wizard experience because we've enabled protocol mechanisms where we can look up the directory on the back end, and we can find the identities that you're trying to federate in. Okay? And in this particular case, we're still talking IT administrators who are developers who actually want to enable, build applications and services on top of AWS infrastructure. This problem became even worse when we actually had an end-user application like Workspaces launch. Um, so that needed IT administrators to provision works, workspaces for their customers. And they definitely don't have the skills to write JSON around policies and be able to set up these trust relationships and con configure the JSON. So we again had to use a, the mechanism we inv invented to enable discovery of users so that they can actually provision access. 
So provisioning access to federated identities and providing protocols to enable that is a critical piece of infrastructure that's amazing today. And this problem just keeps getting worse, right? Now if I'm building a collaboration application, which is what we had to do with WorkDocs, um, now you need to enable these organic access controls where end users need to be able to look up identities within their organizations in a cloud application and enable that. So that's another example of where we had to actually make mechanisms beyond just the federation protocols uh, to enable that granular access control and that sharing and collaboration of end users. Right? So what does that tell you? Right? That tells us that I think we've done good work in terms of building protocols, but I think we have a lot of work ahead of us in terms of if we're going to actually make it easy for applications to go easy to build applications that take advantage of these federated identities. We need mechanisms that make it easy to set federated trust relationships, um, where an application can, can distinguish one federation IDP from another federation IDP in terms of what identities they can assert. Because you don't want one federation IDP, IDP to be able to uh, assert an identity that belongs to some other uh, IDP. Right? So those kinds of distinguishing mechanisms for an application are critical. Being able to look up identities, to be able to look up groups and assertions about those identities is critical as well. Right? How do you build an application that enables that access? How do you go provision access for a user when the user hasn't even shown up the first time if you don't have mechanisms to look up? Right? Um, I sort of joke about uh, where's the DNS for the federated identities, right? Uh, to be able to look up these things and, and grant access. Um, search, when, especially when you start thinking of um, scale of IoT, Internet of Things, where you're dealing with billions of identities, well, lookups are not going to be sufficient. Now you need search capabilities. You need ability to organize these things and be able to look up these uh, in aggregate ways. So I think it's great to be talking about identities, great to be talking about federations, but I think there's a lot of work that we need to go do around actually making these mechanisms easy to use so that people can actually use them. Uh, even developers can actually use them. So that's the thought-provoking thing I want to leave and then open it up to questions. Oh, this is a big room, I'm sure. We can have a lively conversation. <laughs> I, uh, we don't know of any standards where you can do lookups. Yeah. So the question is, um, where, did you look at any open standards, or do you believe that there were no open standards uh, to make this work? Uh, so my simple answer, I don't think there are any open standards to be able to look up cross directories. Um, yeah. Like a lot of the mechanisms I'm seeing is forcing synchronizing of identities across directories, and that's like now I have multiple places to maintain information, and so it's actually getting worse in so, in some ways. Uh, the AD connector. So AD connector is essentially a, a proxy back to the customer's directory. So you should think of it like how any federation, like a web-based um, IDP is built, ultimately it talks to a backend directory and authenticates. ADF, AD Connector does exactly the same thing, except it's running, it's being managed and run in AWS, and we take care of it, and it connects over a VPN tunnel or a direct connect back to the customer's directory and uses LDAP and Kerberos on the backend, but speaks web protocols on the front end. Okay? Uh, and the, but now it actually can look up users, and it can look up group memberships, and all the authorization information that the customer has defined in their directory becomes visible now for cloud applications. You're talking about uh, provisioning access to fragmented IDP. Mm -hmm. uh, would you assume there would be some kind of uh, IP mapping uh, that would associate different identities and different providers? So, so, the question, so the question is, won't I believe that there, for provisioning access, um, there would be some sort of an ID mapping, right, pre-configured? And that's actually the problem. How do I 
go create that ID mapping to begin with. Literally, what customers have to do, they have cut and paste. Uh, they look up the one system, they cut and paste strings, and then they paste them to create these mappings. Or they create sync mechanisms to actually sync all, because doing one at a time is just painful, so they actually sync all of their identity information into another system so that they can actually use that. Um, so the problem is how do you bootstrap the whole thing? You literally either are forced to manually do that stuff, right, or create a, some sort of a sync mechanism. Now you've created duplicate information everywhere. What you want is a mechanism where you can look up, um, right, like LDAP used to provide inside a corporation where you could actually look up identities in the directory and you can grant them access. There is no lookup mechanism. That's why it's sort of the analogy of DNS. Um, on the way. Go ahead. <laughs> so, <laughs> great question. And so, would it, uh, would it not be just now, so because I can do lookups, uh, make it that much easier to go do identity theft, as an example. Uh, so, I think this is, in some ways, this is the challenge back to the industry. But one naive statement I'll make, I haven't deeply thought about this problem, but I'll say the following thing, right? Initially, when you do set up trust, right, where you choose to actually trust a federated, uh, federated IDP, at that point an initial trust has been created. Right? Now, once a, once a trust is created, you should be able to look up. Right? I'm not saying start enabling lookup in an anonymous world, but once a trust is there, uh, you should be able to look up. Right? And you could control what you can look up as well on the, on the system that actually manages the identity. Uh, a lot more work has to be done in the thought air, but um, I, think, I think these mechanisms existed on, in on-prem world, right? and these ex mechanisms are needed for the cloud world as well. Um, and they can be built in a secure way. I'm, I'm convinced they can be built in a secure way. Absolutely. So um, how do I see being managed? So I think there will definitely be many, I, I call them identity pools, if you will, right? Um, I think any attempt to sort of say, oh, there will be one global identity to rule the identities of the world, I don't think it's going to be true. I think there will be a lot of identity pools, right? Um, the worst case scenario of that is every application defines its own identity pool. Right? People go up to it and sign up to it, and voila, they create another identity for themselves in the context of that application. So, um, and in, if you're lucky, these applications will choose to use existing identities as well. Um, so, when, when you talk about, yes, there will be customer identities from an organization's perspective, and their employee identities um, from their organization's perspective. Um, so, but these are identity pools you do want to federate in uh, to your applications. And depending on what kind of use cases you want to enable, certain identities will have access and certain identities will not, right? And you want to provision that access control in an easy to, easy to do way, right? Because if it is too hard, people are not going to do it, or they're going to give broad accesses because it's just, just too hard to go configure these things. They have to be point and click, right? I can start typing and it actually finds me the name so I don't get them wrong. I, um, I joke about this, um, you know, because I'm not uh, 20, 20 plus years in the industry, I joke about it. Like, one of the best innovations that happened in the Active Directory world when I was, you know, people talk about Active Directory, is the object picker that enabled people to pick up users and groups and grant them access. Like, that little thing that enabled and made it easy for looking up principles uh, and grant them access was a key part of what made it easy to use. Right? And that made it possible to have seamless single sign-on and con still control access to different um, sort of resources in your environment. Oh, totally different conversation. Um, why did uh, AWS design Samba-based simple Active Directory versus Microsoft Active Directory? 
Oh, uh, <laughs> some of that uh, sort of predates uh, me, but I think the way you should think about it is uh, we are very much driven by what customers tell us uh, in terms of what customers are asking us. Uh, we're not opposed to Active Directory. Um, at customers with AD Connector, customers use act their Active Directory today. Right? What we heard from customers was that um, where they had Active Directory, they wanted to use the Active Directory they had. So they needed a proxy mechanism, and that's what AD Connector is. And then they wanted a lightweight directory which had AD capabilities in the cloud. Um, and so we um, looked at Samba as one of the options. That doesn't preclude us coming out with a managed Microsoft Active Directory option either, right? Um, as you've seen with, my, uh, with AWS, uh, with like relational database service, we offer SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL. Um, you can very well imagine us going that path as well, right? Um, and that's not just Active Directory. Customers are asking us for LDAP as well. So uh, we very much want to provide the directory solutions that customers actually use. Does that help you? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are in this room. So I think the question is, I hope the question is more to the people in the room than just to me. Uh, I, I, I'm standing on the podium for sure, but as I kind of started off by saying, hey, you know, I left in 2003 and I sort of been coming back into the industry. Um, I think I'm posing the question to the industry as well uh, at this point, as saying, hey, I think um, the work is not done. I think there's a lot of work needed to be done. There's an opportunity. Uh, for, for this industry to actually go invest in mechanisms beyond just the protocols for authentication. Uh, I think my time's up, so I think we are on to the next one. Uh, yeah. Thanks. <laughs>